the if you look at your your uh, title page this will tell you this will tell you where we're going to go therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which we may edify one another follows exactly along with what we have been talking about and then he's going to mention that as i live says the lord every knee will bow to me and every tongue shall confess to god all right let's uh look at chapter 14 and read through it as we move along verse one receive one who is weak in the faith but not to disputes over doubtful things for one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master, he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and give God thanks. For none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live... We live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another any more, but rather resolve this not to put a stumbling block or cause to fail in our brother's way. I know and I and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, then you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself 
in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. And whatever is not from faith is sin. All right. So once again, ladies, we are going to talk about the hard things. We are going to talk about, remember I told you the difference between knowledge and edification, teaching and edification. Teaching is uh, presenting knowledge, something that you have gained, and you present that and share the knowledge. Edification, another gift of the Spirit, is taking what you know, the knowledge that you have, and applying it to your life and encouraging other people to live in that and showing them how God's Word directly affects them. It is my belief that Paul in these last couple of chapters has been leaning heavily into exhortation. More, less about knowledge, and he's strong in knowledge in a lot of areas, in a lot of different books, but in this particular case, it's really more about exhortation. It's about how to take what you know to be the right way to behave and the way that God wants you to be and use that in your daily life. And that's why I keep saying these are the hard things. Because it is super easy to hear someone teach on something and just let it go in ruminate on it a little bit, and then let it go out. And we do that with a lot of things in scriptures. That's why sometimes you can read a scripture verse and go, ha, huh, I never saw that before. Well, maybe the last few times you heard that verse, you were letting it go in and out. And this time you're ruminating on it more, and it's becoming, you're, you're imprinting it into your life. But anytime we can take God's word and apply it directly to us, it changes us. It changes the way you behave. It changes the way you think. It changes the way you interact with your neighbor, with your family, with your friends, with your brothers and sisters. It changes you. God's word is life-changing. So if you're reading scripture or someone is, uh, you know, that's one of the issues I have with uh, when it's a, 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 a liturgical service where you everyone repeats the same thing and they do it as a habit and it's every other week it's the same thing. I struggle with that because I think that's just knowledge. You learn the words and you say them. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. Okay, that's great. How many times do you think about what that literally means and apply it to the way that you behave or the way you think about your nation or any of those things? Very few. Most people, we teach it to the little kindergartners and the first graders, and they know the words. They have no idea what indivisible under God means. And so, but they say it because that's knowledge. They've learned the words. And we can be that way with God's word. We can hear it, and, 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 and uh, some of us are really good at, um, you know, learning it, memorizing it, and you can, you can say it. But do you apply it to your life? And that's what we've been talking about. In chapter 12, we talked about it. In chapter 13, we talked about it. And now we're going to be talking about it in how we interact with our brothers and sisters. Because there is a right way and a wrong way to take God's word in that. And what we're going to be talking about here is liberty, freedom. Uh, there's a, a song, you know, uh, whom, this, uh, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. There's that song on the radio. And, and um, it's absolutely true. And we are given a ton of freedom and liberty under this law of grace. The Jewish people in the Old Testament would have been stunned that this is the way that we are allowed to live because they had rules regulating everything what they ate and what they drank and the clothes they wear and the things they did. They had rules for everything. And so the fact that we have liberty in Christ Jesus is a stunning concept that we so oftentimes mess up, kind of like the Pharisees did with the Torah law. So they took what God had intended for an abundant life. They took what God had intended to bring his people into a closer relationship with him. And they messed it up and added those fences around it and, and uh, uh, added new laws on top of it and changed it and did it to where nobody knew what they were even doing anymore. 
There was certainly no liberty. There was certainly no freedom. You remember the story about the man who's healed at the pool and, and, um, and he's healed and he's been, he's been uh, crippled for 30 years and he gets up and he's instantly healed and instantly knows how to walk and his leg muscles are strong and, and, uh, one of the apostles that's with him says, pick up your mat and leave because you're not going to need that anymore. And the Pharisees honed in on that, picking up your mat. It's a sin to pick up your mat on the Sabbath because that healing was on the Sabbath. And you think to yourself, they didn't even notice that a, that a man who was lame for 30 years got up and walked? Do you not have anything to say about that? Because that's the big stuff. And then really why Jesus did it is so that everyone around would say, who is he? Who is this man that heals the lame? Who is this man that causes him to walk and to leave and has the power and authority to do that? Who is this man? And that's why Jesus even did it. But the Pharisees didn't ask who it is. And the Pharisees didn't say, how can you possibly be walking? They said, how dare you lift your mat? Okay, so we laugh about that and we think how silly that is, but we do some of that today. We do some of that. And so it's, called, it's given a term, it's called legalism. It's following the letter of the law to the point where you miss the whole reason that the law is given. That's what we see the Pharisees doing and that's what we have a tendency to get into in some ways if we're not careful. So let's see how some of that works. Um, Maybe it would be best if I go over this first page with you so that as I'm teaching, you'll have this, uh, you'll already have this. Look at your first page that starts out legalism definition. Okay, so legalism is when a person or a group of people attempt to secure righteousness in God's sight by performing good works. Legalists believe that they can earn or merit the favor of God by performing good works and or attempts to follow the law and traditions of men. A legalist believes that good works and proper obedience to God will affect their salvation. Okay, so that's a difficult thing uh, to try and convince some people of because oftentimes they're just really trying hard to follow everything that they think God wants them to do. And so they're all bound up. Oh my goodness, I have to get up every morning and spend 30 minutes in my, you know, quiet time. And I have to read one of the Old Testament scriptures, one of the New Testament scriptures and a Psalm and a proverb. I have to do, you know, and they, you get all of this in and you're really trying to do the right thing. But when you do it, not with the purpose of building a relationship to the Lord, not with a purpose of waking up this morning, you know, in the morning and saying, you know, Lord, how, how do you how do you want to meet with me today? How will we meet? And so and not allowing yourself the freedom of building the relationship, but instead you're doing the tasks. Lots of religions have done that. You have to do this, this, and this, and if you don't, your salvation is at stake. As if God would has a balance sheet. You know, I tell the story because it's such a cute story of a friend of mine who told me that when she was growing up, uh, you know, she really took to heart the 10%. Give the 10%. Always give 10%. And so, which by the way, there's a whole teaching on that. That's not even a biblical principle, but we're going to, we won't go into that. That's a whole rabbit trail that we'll go down later. But, uh, it, the, the 10%. And as a young person, she took that so serious that she had a little notebook that she carried in her purse. And when she added up her jobs for the week and her allowance and everything else. And then she figured out what 10% was. And that was what she would put in the plate. But some weeks she wanted to buy something at the store and it cost a little bit much. And so she didn't have her 10%. And so she kept a balance sheet and she would say, Lord, I owe you $3 this week because I really don't have all the money. I spent it on this and I don't have it. So I owe you $3, but next week I'll give you my 10% plus $3. And, and she said, um, 
the thing of it is, is that list gets all meshed up. I owe you, I paid you, I now I owe you again. I, you know, it was, so it wasn't this idea of, of being generous to the Lord with what you have and feeling good about what you give. It's this guilt of, oh, I, I shorted the Lord $2 this week. And you do that. Now that's legalism because that's not what God intended for it to be. But we, t- but when you're looking at the letter of the law so precisely that you lose the meaning of giving from the heart, giving with joy, giving to the Lord, and, and, and feeling wonderful about being able to participate in that. When you lose that, you've lost the whole purpose. It's no longer from the heart. How many times have we discussed the fact that if it's not from the heart, it's hay and stubble? Paul says that. If I, no matter what I do, if I speak in the tongue of angels, and it's not with love, if it's not from the heart, then it's nothing. It's a gong. It means nothing to me. So, so when you get so involved in legalism, remember that's the hay and stubble stuff. We're not, what do I mean by that? It means that it, when, when uh, you stand before the Lord with your works, that's the stuff that gets burned up because it didn't come from the heart. The, the things that come from the heart that affected your relationship with the Lord, that's the gold and silver that's refined. And so everything has to come from the heart. That's the issue with legalism. So the opposite of legalism. So the opposite is faith. Without good works, and here's the important one, prior to good works. Okay? So you, it's not, it has your relationship with the Lord, your salvation with the Lord, your experience with the Lord. It comes prior to doing any good works. You know, the truth of the matter is, is that God will come and meet you where you are, not where you think you should be. So you can't say, as soon as I get this duck in a row and this duck in a row and this duck in a row, I'm ready to have a relationship with the Lord. You know, I, I, I need to get, I need to stop doing this and I need to add this to my list of things that I do. And once I do that, I think I'm ready to work with the Lord and be in relationship with him. Instead, it's right where we're at, right where we're at. And he comes to you and says, I cannot love you any more than I love you right now. And so the works that we do are because we love the Lord and we want to just keep giving back to the one who gave us everything. But, but your faith experience, your salvation experience, that's prior to your good works. So without good works and prior to good works that take us to heaven, we come to God and obtain salvation by God by faith and faith alone. An example of legalism in scripture. So here's just a couple of, this shows you what legalism looks like. Also, he spoke this parable, Jesus is speaking parables, to some who trusted in themselves that were righteous and despised others. So two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector, a hated person. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortionists, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, wouldn't even raise his eyes to heaven but beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you this, says Jesus, this man went down to his house justified. What does it mean? Just as if the sins had never happened, rather than the Pharisee, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who is humbled himself will be exalted. So here's the perfect example of legalism. The Pharisee is a legalist. I give tithes. I do this. I sacrifice. I teach. I wear the right clothing. I do the right thing. I say the right words. Legalist. The tax collector, one of the most hated people in the community, said nothing except for, Lord, be my savior. Save me. Be my savior. I am a sinner. And in God's eyes, that's everything. That's the relationship building right there. An argument to legalism. 
Uh, if someone is a legalist, this is the perfect one. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. What a scripture we all know and just distinctly teaches against legalism. Here are the examples of legalism. Focusing on God's laws more than a relationship with God. Keeping all the external laws without a truly submitted heart and adding human rules to God's word and treating them as divine instruction. I feel like that's the one we fail at the most. And so we'll get to that. Reminder against legalism, obedience is how a Christian should live. It is not how they are saved. Good works has nothing to do with the act of justification. We are pronounced righteous when we come under the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Remember, take on that cloak. And it has nothing to do with any effort on our part. Legalism is, do is doctrinally opposed to grace. So they're two separate, uh, two separate th issues. So uh, here's an example in Colossians of Paul teaching the same things. He says, therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of this wor world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves again to regulations? Don't touch, don't taste, do, don't handle, which all concern things which perish with using, according to the commandments and the doctrines of men. These things have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, what you're putting on yourself in the legalistic attitudes that you have. It's false humility and neglect of the body, but they are no, of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. So even if you're fasting, even if you're, uh, you know, in the early uh, 1100s, 1200s, there was this thing where people flayed themselves with, you know, whips and stuff so when they sinned so that they could somehow punish themselves for a sin that they committed as if that made it all all right. There's no need. God doesn't want those stripes. His son carried the stripes. His son bore the stripes so that you don't have to. So we don't need those stripes. You don't need to abuse your body with rules and regulations that God never imposes, but that some man has imposed upon you. And that was really quite a popular thing. All right. Oops, I better keep this. All right. So let's look at verse one of our chapter now. Receive one who is weak in the flesh, or in the faith, sorry, one who is weak in the faith, but not to dispute over doubtful things. All right, so here we need to talk about helping a weaker brother. And what exactly does it mean? Who is weak? Well, there's several ways you can be weak. One way that you can be weak is if you are a babe in Christ. And you're just, you're just freshly coming into a relationship with the Lord and you don't know everything yet. God's going to meet you right where you're at. He, he will never love you more than he does at that moment. But that's how a person can be weak. They're not spiritually mature yet. They're not grounded. They don't have all of that behind them. You can be sick with a disease like legalism. That makes you weak when you're sick with a disease. Number three, you can be malnourished. That's how you can be weak. What does that mean? If you haven't gotten the proper teaching and you, don't, you haven't consumed God's word and you haven't made that part of your life and you haven't allowed that to build you up and make you strong, if you haven't done that, you're malnourished. Think about what that looks like in the human body. That's exactly what it looks like in the spiritual world. When you have not nourished your body with the bread and the living water of God's word. All right, and then the fourth way that you can be weak is with a lack of exercise. I think we all know that one. And um, the exercise comes from exactly what we're doing today. The exhortation of telling you, here are the hard things and here is how God wants you to live. And then you go, mm, it's too hard. I don't want to exercise that. I don't want to go out and do that and, 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 and uh, you know, love my enemy and pray for those who persecute me and love the stranger and do, I don't want to, it's too hard. Lack of exercise 
can also make a person weak. And that's the exercise is using what you know uh, that God would have us do. So he is weak in the faith, but not to dispute over doubtful things. So it's not that you want to go after any of the people that maybe are suffering with the things that I've just talked about in those area. It's not that. It's that um, you don't want to have a dispute over things that are not salvation issues. You don't want this to be an argument. You don't want this to be a debate. Have you ever heard the saying that there are spine issues and there are rib issues? So a spine issue are the important issues. That's what keeps you upright in the faith. That's what keeps you strong. It's what keeps you working. Those are spine issues. And you can't vary on those. That would be the salvation in the Lord Jesus alone. That would be faith. That would be the, the, the issues that you cannot, you cannot argue about because they are doctrinally correct. And Paul says, if anyone tries to teach you a gospel, even if it were an angel, it's a false gospel other than what I'm teaching you. So these are spine then there are rib issues. You know what? You can break a rib and still live. You can break a rib and still manage. Rib issues are the things that generally cause denominations and, and disputes in the church. Things that are not necessarily a, a salvation issue, but for some people can become so important that it, it changes their walk with the Lord. Um, I know of churches who have divided over rib issues, like instead of having communion cups, uh, it, it talked about the cup in the Bible that Jesus took at the Passover meal, and so they only have one cup. And if you have multiple cups, then it's sin. I know of people who, uh, I'm trying to think of, you know, who uh, won't have a musical instrument in their worship, and those who say if you don't have a musical instrument, you're not following God's Law. I know of people who only baptize, this was a new one for me, um, going forward, not back. That's a, that's a, a, a rib issue. Um, I mean, I'm sure you can think of issues. Maybe you've been involved in churches that have split or had problems. And usually, not always, but usually it's not spine issues. It's the rib issues. And Paul is going to be very clear here that when we're talking about those type of issues, we are to, first of all, work through those issues with love. Not the spine issues. The spine issues are a whole different matter. So, um, for one, verse 2, For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Okay, that's not talking about vegetarians. All right? So, what they're doing, they're, if you notice here, who is the weak one in this example? The weak one is the one who only eats vegetables. Why is that? Because God doesn't tell you that you can, can only eat vegetables. That's not God's rule. It wasn't in the Old Testament, and it isn't in the New Testament. In fact, God, God makes it perfectly clear to Peter, doesn't he, in the sheet episode, that everything is clean. Why would you call anything unclean that is clean, that I have called clean? And so the meat itself is not the issue, but he is calling the one who has set up the rule and said, meat is not clean, only vegetables, as the weak one. Because he's saying you can, uh, that can be an issue with legalism. Now, the issue becomes when you make that a salvation issue, meat is a salvation issue, or when you insist that all those around you do the same thing. Only you, all of us have to eat, eat vegetables only. If you are eating meat, then obviously you are sinning. So that's kind of where he's going with this particular example. He says, let him who eats and despot, let him not, ugh, let me start over three. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. So, um, the eating of the vegetables isn't for the body. It's a spiritual reason. Somehow he thinks that eating only vegetables is going to uh, make him closer to God. We see examples of that all throughout history, that people adding things that they do uh, that somehow they think makes them more religious, 
more spiritual. And whatever that happens to be, not only do you tend to be the one who does it, but you also, you also enforce it on other people. The worst example of legalism. And so he's saying, if a person doesn't want to eat vegetables, that's, their, that's fine for them. That's fine. There's nothing. You have, you have freedom. If you only, only want to eat carrots, that's fine. You have freedom to do what you want to do. But the one who only eats vegetables should not despise the one who eats meats. And the one who eats everything and eats meats should not despise the one who has put himself in the little box and eaten only vegetables. Because they're doing what they believe is right in their own eyes, and you have freedom to make those decisions. Let's move on a little bit there. Uh, For God has received him. In other words, it goes back to what I was just saying. God has received you. God meets you right where you're at. God is there for the one who eats only vegetables. And God is there for the one who eats all things. That, that's, that neither one of those things have a thing to do with, the, with your relationship to God in his eyes. However, what man tends to do is they make it a situation. The one who eats only vegetables makes it, a, 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 you know, says we must do this. And the one who eats only, that eats all things oftentimes then has a bad attitude towards the one who's eating vegetables. So both of them in this case can be at fault. But God receives both because the food that you consume is not the issue that God is looking at here. It says, who are you to judge another's, another's servant? To his own master, he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. So what he's saying is we are all servants of God. Okay, we, we all belong to God. So who are you to judge God's servants? Can, can you go over to, it's kind of out of touch for us because we don't have servants. But if you did, could you go over to your neighbor and, and start telling them how they should treat their own people? No. You, you couldn't do that. And so what he's saying is they, these people belong to God. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? These are God's. And God alone is the one who makes him stand. Look at five. One person esteems one day above another, and another esteems every day alike. So these are now matters of conscience. He's going to be talking about principles. It's not the idea... The idea of each one of these individual incidents is happening. It's kind of weird because legalists tend to take this verse and make it really legalistic. That it's literally talking about the day. Or it's literally talking about a vegetable. Or it's literally talking about a time. And, And that's just a legalistic attitude because this is a principle of it doesn't matter. None of this stuff matters. If you take one day and esteem it over another day, that's that's a principle here. Now you can talk about, oh, there are, you know, but this day, Easter is so important or to a Christian religion, or the Jewish people have the Day of Atonement, or the Muslims have their Ramadan days. And, you know, church uh, religious people will make it about that, but that's not what he's talking about here. Those, these things are terribly, terribly unimportant. It says, um, but you need to be fully convinced in your own mind. So that is telling you that you need to come to an understanding of what is between you and God, between the master and the servant. If esteeming one day above another, you believe that that is where God is directing you, and you believe that that is what he would have for you, then you need to obey that. But if you don't see the importance of esteeming one day above another, and you don't celebrate those holidays, and you don't do that, and you do it as a matter of conscience, because you believe that that is not what God would have you do, then it becomes sin if you do it. Either way. It's a matter of your mindset with God. Now you go, well, we'd all be doing different things. It's kind of like judges when every man did what was right in his own eyes. Well, you know what? We have some guidance. Our guidance is God's word. Our guidance is knowing God's word, knowing what he would direct of us, knowing how he wants us to act, knowing how he wants us to respond out of love, knowing all of these things. That's our guiding compass. 
in all of this. And so these little details about whether or not women should wear pants in the church, whether or not you should wear sandals and show your, your toes, whether or not your head needs to be covered, whether or not you, uh, you know, this, that, or the other, whatever it is that people put on it, he's saying it needs to be a conscience. I have a very dear friend who believes that women should not leave their heads uncovered in, in uh, when they're worshiping, all right? And she firmly believes that. And she, she puts it on uh, uh, no matter where she's worshiping. And I think that that's perfectly fine. I don't cover my head. I don't see that as something that I need to do. But, but I respect the fact that she believes that's where God has her, and she faithfully does that. It would be wrong of me to try and talk her out of that. That goes back to this, don't be doing this over debates, over silly things. It would be so wrong of me to tell her, no, you should, that's just ridiculous. That's not. And it would be wrong of her to come to me with a little scarf and say, you really should wear this. Either one of us, it would be wrong. But she is doing what she believes God would have her do. And so her conscience is asking her to do that. And so it would be wrong for her not to do it. She would be a going against what her conscience is telling her. So he who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe it the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. All right, so I want you to notice as we go, in fact, it would be good if you underlined it every time we see the phrase to the Lord, because you're going to see that over and over here in this chapter, and we're going to talk about what that means. He who eats, eats uh, to the Lord. What does that mean? It means that you eat the way that God would have you eat. You have a mindset of what is it that God would have me eat. If you eat a diet of cupcakes all day long, do you believe that that's what God would have you do for a healthy body? You know, I'm just going to say this. If you really, in your heart of hearts, firmly believe that God would have you eat only cupcakes, then I'm not going to talk you out of it. But, but knowing how God is in his word, we also have to come to a realization that is not a healthy alternative for our bodies. And we're not being good stewards so that we don't have the strength to go out and do the plans and purposes of God. So there's a whole mindset that goes there. But what he's saying is when you eat, you do it with a full good conscience to the Lord. Now that can go to other things. That can go to a person who eats only the most expensive of foods and lets the people on the street go hungry. That can go to the person who is gluttonous and eats more than their body needs. That can go, there's a lot of areas that God's word talks about when it talks about food. But what you have to understand in your heart of hearts, knowing God's word, listening to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, experiencing what you know God has in mind for you today, you have to decide because what you eat, you eat to the Lord. And if it's a dishonoring way that we're eating, we're dishonoring God. If it's an honoring way that we're eating, we're honoring God. That's what it means to the Lord. Everything you do is with a mindset of, is this what you would have for me, Lord? Is this what you would have for me? And so he goes on with that. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. When he eats and he's thankful for what God has given him and his conscience is clear in the things that he's eating, he's doing it to the Lord. Jesus ate. He ate even after he came back uh, from the resurrection. He ate. Eating is a, is a human thing, and it is an act of worship when we take something that God has provided and we thank him for the graciousness of his gift. Now, I'm a firm believer, little rabbit trail, that you are not to bless food. That's my thing. I believe that you bless the provider of the food. That's just my thing, because that's, that's where it is. It's in the one who gives us. So when we pray, Lord, thank you for your provision of this meal. Thank you for your provision of this bread. Thank you. And that is how you, the examples in the scripture that you see. It's always about the one who gives. It's kind of like that concept of um, you're really not supposed to uh, 
get tied up in the miracle, you really should be consumed with the miracle maker because that's the importance of it. So it's that kind of a concept. So um, if he gives thanks to the Lord and he has no problem with it, he needs to do it. But he who does not eat to the Lord um, does not eat to the Lord and he gives thanks for that. So if they're fasting or if they're not eating and they're thanking Lord for the Lord for this time and he's doing it with a clear conscience and this is what the Lord has prompted him to do, then he's doing it to the Lord. And either way, you are not to judge someone else for what it is that they're doing because you have freedom. Remember, you have the freedom to determine whether you eat or whether you don't eat. Notice here, the one thing he didn't give you freedom on is giving thanks unto the Lord for that because that's part of our relationship with God. For none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. No man is an island, right? So whether you live, whether you die, we have to reach that point in our life that says it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I live or if I die. If I, what, what happens? Because when I live, I live to the Lord. And when I die, I die to the Lord. And so it's in the Lord's hands. Whatever happens, happens. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived, lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Once again, meeting you where you are. He's the Lord of everyone, of every, of every believer. He's the Lord of each one of them, whether you live or die, whether you eat or you don't eat, no matter what. He's, he's the Lord who meets you there. So he says in 10, so, so why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother in an application of all these freedom things? Why do we get all tied up in the people who have built these rules and regulations? Well, primarily, we might get, we might get caught up in it because if they're trying to enforce it on you. If you go to a church and your leaders in your church are putting a fence around God's word in some way saying you must do this in order to maintain your relationship with the Lord, my suggestion is that you leave that church because that's not what God would have. God does not have people stand up and go outside of his word and put rules and regulations and fences around you that says you must, you must, you must, you must do this and you just are under an obligation to follow that. That's, that's, not the, uh, that's not the application of freedom. So because of that, it says we are uh, not to judge our brother in areas of that, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. In other words, you have enough to deal with because you're going to have to stand in front of the Lord. So here's the thing. When you stand in front of the Lord, you don't get to say, oh, yeah, but, you know, Suzanne did this, or LaVon did that, or, you know, or, or I saw Lori and she did this, Lord. God isn't going to listen to that. He's not concerned with that. We don't talk about that. That's not, our, that's not our standard. When we are standing before the Lord, he is going to hear an accounting from each of us about us, not about our husband, not about our kids, not about the pastor, not about, and it's you. It's you and the Lord having that application to each other. And he says, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. So then each of us shall give an accounting of himself to God. And I'm going to stop there. Um, this idea, this, this scripture is from Isaiah chapter 45 that is given to us. And what they're talking about here is the judgment seat of Christ. That's that Bema seat. I think we've talked about it. I think we talked about it in Revelation. The Bema seat, where we stand before the Lord and give an accounting of our uh, actions. Yes, we did because we had the discussion of, well, we don't care if we get a big crown or a little crown or whatever that is. So we had that discussion. But it's the idea that we stand before the Lord and we give an accounting of what we have done, like he doesn't already know, but we stand before him. And, and based on that, we are given rewards. And we really don't know what those are. 
we really don't have any idea what those are or whether we even keep them or lay, or lay them down at the feet of Jesus Christ when we receive them. We don't know. But we do know that that is an accounting at the Bema seat that believers have. Guess what, ladies? That has nothing to do with your salvation. That's not judging whether or not you get to spend eternity with Christ. That's not that. That's the great white throne judgment. And the great white throne judgment, we discussed that in Revelation, comes at the very end, and that's for unbelievers. Those are the ones who said, Lord, judge me on my works. I don't want a relationship with Jesus. I don't need Jesus in my life. Judge me on my works. And God says, okay, I'm going to judge you on your works. And then they stand before the Lord, and of course their works are not enough because that's not it. So that's unbelievers' salvation. We're talking about the Bema seat where believers will stand. And so I am going to stop there and we'll finish 14 next, no, nope, not next week, in June, uh, the first week of June. We will finish that. All right. I think maybe, maybe, uh, I'm wondering if I should. Questions, we got through half.